This choosing beggar decided to take a nap instead of going to work, but he wants a share of the tips for that evening. However, his co-workers are not going to let him get away with it. Happy birthday, today's your birthday, and on with the revamped show. When I was in college, I worked at a local pizza shop that was right across the street from campus. The staff in a shift would be three to four guys, one to make pizza, one to help coordinate orders, one to run register, and a floater. Bus tables, take out food, restock the food, etc. There were two shifts each day that switched at 5pm, and we had a tip jar that would get split up at the end of each shift. It was a Sunday, and I had been working the morning shift with two other guys, co-worker and choosing beggar. Choosing beggar was making pizzas, co-worker running register and bussing tables. I was taking orders, running food, whatever needed to be done to help everyone else out. It was about 2.30pm and the store was pretty quiet, so Choosing beggar said he was going to run to his apartment and would be right back. He lived next door and business was slow so I didn't think anything of it. He's gone for a little while and we start to see a trickle of customers come in. I knew how to make pizzas so I went to work. Coworker and I knock out all of the orders and deliver everyone their food and are relaxing while the customers eat. Once the customers had left and we cleaned the tables, coworker said one left us $6 and put it in the tip jar. When Choosing Beggar finally gets back at 4.45, he walks in all stressed and says sorry he's late. He took a nap and overslept. I'm thinking, wow dude, literally sleeping on the job, but whatever. I'm not usually confrontational and just let it go. Since it's close to the end of our shift, the new team is starting to arrive so we split up the tip jar. I pull all the money out and start splitting it into three, but I set aside the $6 from the customers co-worker and I covered on our own to be split between just me and him. Choosing beggar was in the back, but comes up front to get his share of the tips. He sees me finish up and give co-worker and myself $3 extra each, then hand him his stack. Hey, you guys got more tips than me. Yeah, when you were at your apartment, we had some customers come in and they left us $6. And why do only you and co-worker get that? Because you were gone for over two hours on a break and we took care of them. Man, that's bullcrap. When we work on a shift together, we split the entire tip jar together. You were a freaking sleep. You don't deserve this tip at all. Co-worker and I earned this. Man, frick this. I'm telling the boss when he gets in. I was livid that he felt entitled to this money when he bailed on us during the shift and I just wanted to be done with him. So I took $2 out of my tips and slammed it on the counter and said, here's your money. I don't want it anymore. It's about the principle of the thing now. I'm gonna tell the boss that you tried to screw me out of some money of the tip jar. I just grabbed the money, clocked out and left. My next shift was the following Thursday and choosing beggar was not working my shift. When I got in, the boss was there, and while everyone was standing up front, he called me into the back of the store in the kitchen. Now, this is where I have to mention that I had been working at the shop for over three years at this point, and was considered one of the best workers we had. Choosing Beggar had been working for about three months. I definitely had the trust and confidence of my superiors. I walk into the back and he says, Choosing Beggar came to him and said I didn't split the tip jar fairly last shift and I owe him $2. I explained my side of what happened, that Choosing Beggar left and fell asleep in his apartment, that we handled those customers while he was gone, and that I even offered him the $2 that day, but he wouldn't take it. The boss said he believed my version and thought Choosing Beggar's story sounded uncharacteristic of me. He told me that if the situation ever happened again, to first call him and he'll come up to the shop to bust Choosing Beggar, and second, to split those tips before Choosing Beggar gets back next time. I understand why some of these businesses have the splitting the tip jar policy. There is an element of chance that you happen to be serving a customer that's more generous than someone else. And so if you split it evenly, chances are that generosity is split equally. The problem is, and we can see from this story, not everyone works as hard as everybody else. And usually when somebody gives a tip, it's because they're rewarding that particular person for the excellent service that they received. You kind of disincentivize good service if you know that your reward is just going to go to everyone else as well. Hi there. As indicated by the title, I'm living in a college dorm with my choosing beggar roommate and my wonderful service dog. 
I never really got along very well with my roommate to begin with, but we more or less coexisted until very recently. It has only been in the last few weeks of the school year that my roommate has decided to take out whatever end of the year stress she has on my poor dog. And so we begin. I have a 10 year old Labrador that I trained from puppyhood to provide the support I need. She has acclimated to college life very well and loves getting attention from students, going on long walks and sleeping the day away in the dorm and is essentially in the doggy version of a classy retirement home. She doesn't bark, chew, bite or misbehave in any way and is extremely well trained. That said, she, like most dogs, has one particularly annoying trait. She sheds a lot. Especially now that it is summer, the amount of dog hair I find in all sorts of nooks and crannies is truly ridiculous. I do my very best to brush her and vacuum on the daily, but I can only do so much. In addition, my choosing beggar roommate has been very picky about how I go about my day-to-day -day life. When interacting with the room, she has attempted to instill 8.30pm curfews to ensure she gets her full 16 hours. She has put up a curtain around her bed and desk to divide the room. She has demanded that I not turn on the ceiling lights at any time and instead rely on various lamps simply because that is what she prefers. She has demanded that I leave my dorm for five days while her boyfriend visited. These are just a few examples of choosing Beggar's various rules for the sake of illustrating what type of person she is. I usually try my best to not bother her without having to go too far out of my way. I've been very tempted to do some malicious compliance, but I am forced to live with this nut job, so I'd rather not add fuel to her fire. Now, the choosing Beggar incident that really made me boil over happened just today. One of the rules she has in place is to respect her property by staying on my half of the room and keeping my dog on my half of the room as well. And she decided to enforce this by laying down a masking tape line, dividing our spaces like we were in some sort of sitcom. As if I'd want to go anywhere near her things in the first place. Naturally, I found that infuriating, not at all practical. Since my elderly service dog has no concept of borders, I brought this to her attention and we agreed to scrap the physical tape line so long as the rule it represented was followed. And as a clarification, this rule applied to my dog and her things as well. Her bed, food bowls, toys and her shed hair, all of which I have no control over the placement of, were all unwelcome on Choosing Beggar's side of the room. Apparently, Choosing Beggar thinks her ridiculous demands can be communicated to my dog. And even if my dog could grasp the concept, I'm pretty sure she wouldn't give a darn anyway. Today, Choosing Beggar woke me up from a midday nap and confronted me on this very issue, asking why I couldn't control my dog and why I couldn't keep her things in a fixed position and why her hair kept ending up on her side of the room. As a reminder, I'm living in a dorm room the size of a closet and I clean daily. It got to the point where she accused me of maliciously planting it there to tick her off. My response was simply that if I wanted to tick her off, my method wouldn't be so subtle and that all credit was due to the natural shedding of my dog's winter fur. No matter what I did, she didn't seem to grasp the idea that number one, her demands were physically impossible to meet due to the fact that the dog will move around the room as she sees fit. And number two, when it comes to individual hairs and other such objects that are not fixed to the ground and can move, maybe be moved by the dog herself due to issue number one. It wasn't until she called me a liar for stating obvious facts and then went on to claim that my service dog was a waste of space and a burden to her and suggesting that she be removed from the dorm that I completely boiled over. At this point, she was grasping at straws to keep the argument going, but claiming that my dog was a problem and needed to be kicked out was too far. I need my service dog with me. She is more than a pet, and for her to say that my dog needed to go so she could have her way was not acceptable. I simply got out of bed, walked up to her, looked her in the eye, and said in a booming, bellowing yell, I didn't even know I could produce, you cannot talk to me this way, check your ego, and stormed out. And unfortunately, that is where it ends. I've been facing the silent treatment for quite a while now, and given how much choosing and begging my roommate does, 
I'm not all that upset, and my dog still doesn't follow her rules. Good puppy. So this just happened to me a few months ago. I had bought an 18 inch tall steel king size bed frame off Amazon roughly two years ago, and due to shoddy welds, the bed started to come apart. After calling warranty, a new frame was being sent out. My wife decided she really didn't like how tall the bed was. She's 5 foot 3, I'm 6 4. So she wanted me to build a new frame for us instead of using the replacement. In order to pay for the materials, I decided I was going to list the bed on the Facebook marketplace for $100 because Amazon had it for $140 and I put up a snapshot showing as much. Within three hours, I received a message. Hi, is this frame still available? And are you flexible on price? Yes it is, and you are free to make me an offer. $25. Sorry, no, this frame is normally $140, like I said in the post, and it's new in the box. $100 is a fair price. What's the lowest you'll go? Side rant, I hate this question. I'm not about to lowball myself and will always respond with the original asking price, but you can make a reasonable offer. I won't bore you with the back and forth, but we eventually settle at $75, and she would be there that day with a truck and a friend because this was a large, heavy box. True to her word, she showed up at my house an hour later, and I met her in the garage where the frame was stored. Hi, so here's the frame. As I said, it's new in the box. This isn't the same frame as in the picture. I assure you it is. I then pull out my phone and show her it's the same one. Well, because I don't believe this is the same frame, would you take $50? No, we agreed on $75. I know, but I don't think it's worth $75. How about $60? I was getting annoyed. You're right, it's worth more than $75. I only agreed to that price to cover the cost of building my new bed. I can do $70, but I have to keep the extra $5 because I had to drive so far out to meet you. I asked where she drove from and it was a whopping 7 miles away. Frustrated and ready to be done with this. Okay, fine. If keeping the $5 is what it takes to be done, I'll take the 70. It's at this point I looked over at what she drove as I asked where her help was. Sitting on the side of the road was one of those Aztec wannabe trucks. So, where's your help? Oh, I just figured you'd be willing to load it for me. You're so big. Sure, it'll cost you $10. What? That's outrageous! You do that to a single mother? I was waiting for this to be said. I run a consignment store, and I need as much money as I can to support my son and I. I'm sorry ma'am, but the ad clearly stated that you'd need to bring help and a truck. I'm not even sure how you're going to load it in that thing. Choosing Beggar tries to lift the frame by herself, and almost topples over. <laughs> Fine, here's the ten dollars. I hope you're happy that you've stolen food out of my son's mouth. I hoisted the frame up and somehow managed to get it loaded into her truck. The entire time she kept saying that I was ripping her off and that if I damaged her car, that she'd sue me. Before I loaded that frame, I took a picture of her tailgate just to cover myself while she wasn't looking. Better safe than sorry, because there were several scratches along the top ridge. Sure enough, five days later, I receive a handwritten note with the proof from the attorney saying that I damaged the tailgate and that they'll see me in court unless I agree to pay $85 to have it repaired. I contacted her through Facebook again, showing the picture I had taken myself with the timestamp, showing all the damage that was in her picture. She blocked me, and I haven't heard anything since. If I have to sell something through one of those online marketplaces, I just avoid people like this. The slightest sign of trouble, you just know it's not going to be worth it. Someone else will come along, even if you have to wait just a little bit longer. I feel like the hero of the story didn't even have to go down to $70. He was probably just trying to avoid the hassle. The reality is she drove out there and she doesn't want to waste her time. So if she agreed on $75, she's going to pay the $75. You can always say no and wait for someone else. Now if somebody really is a single mum and needs help, of course it's a good thing to help them. The problem in this situation is she didn't ask for it, she demanded and expected it. Which to me is a huge red flag that she's not asking for help. She's using her situation to exploit other people. I feel like our culture has such a victimhood mentality now that people desire these sorts of situations just so that they can use other people. I'm curious to hear your thoughts though. Do you know people that use their misfortune to exploit other people? 
Of course, I'm not saying everyone who's dealt a bad hand is like this, simply that people who have that kind of selfish nature will use whatever situation they're in to try and take advantage of others. A few weeks ago, I put an ad online selling a red oak table with five chairs. I put it up for $80 on the condition it be picked up. I get the usual low ball offers, which now I don't entertain. One woman said that she would take it for $80 and that she will come the day after. I said okay, gave her my address, phone number, and email, and took down the ad as it is considered sold. She messaged me shortly after, asking me if I can discount $10 for the gas of her buddy's moving truck. I kinda wanted it gone, and the ad was down, so I agreed to it. Jump to the next day, no word from her. I replied to her email, and no answer. I figured she flaked, so I waited another day before putting the ad back up. About an hour after I do, she messages me, telling me we had a deal and that she still wants it. I told her she can still come, but I'm not going to take down the ad and I'll entertain other offers. She said that it isn't very Christian of me and that because I caused her and her cats to stress, don't know why she brought up the cats, that I should discount it and deliver it. I said sorry, no way, because A, the deal is you pick it up and B, I don't even have a van to do it. And C, it's already being discounted. About three hours later, she messages me and tells me she found me on Facebook and saw one of my relatives works for a car rental company, so I should contact him to get a van and deliver it right away, otherwise there will be consequences to my immoral and evil business practices. I let her know that me and that relative aren't that close, and also I didn't appreciate her looking me up. I told her I have decided to keep the table, and I'd rather use it as kindling to warm my evil soul than sell it to her. She simply replied with a message saying that the Better Business Bureau had been contacted. I didn't bother replying after that because I don't want my non-existent furniture store to be reported. I like how her biggest defense was that her cats were stressed. Maybe if the other person was a cat person, they'd feel bad for them or something like that. But try that in any other situation. My cats are stressed, so therefore I deserve a discount. Most people are just gonna laugh at you. I feel like these online marketplaces need a review option where you can say, this person is a choosing beggar, beware. And if enough people give them that review, they get like an official tag next to their name. That way we can warn everybody else. Submit your story to be read on the channel at voiceyhearstories at gmail.com and join our Voicey Veteran community at r slash voiceyhear. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit that bell to never miss an episode. Alright Voicey Veterans, I'll see you in the next one.